anyways, let's let's get started here. I'm pumped for this one because uh, I've been looking forward to it. I, I know a bit about your story and, and the approach you take to sports and really the transition <laughs> that you've kind of taken um, from track and field and now looking at your social media, really getting into motivation and public speaking. And I know you self-authored a book as well. And congrats on that because that's a, I could never... It's one thing that I've kind of thought about a bit, but it's such a huge project kind of thinking about where to start. is such a struggle, but, um, but like I said, really looking forward to this man. And, and I want to kind of start off with, with a, a really general question, I guess. The question I like to ask a lot of the athletes is when you hear the word sports psychology, or you hear the words mental side of sports, what's really the first thing that comes to your mind? Well, man, I appreciate you having me, man. Um, the first thing that I would say that comes to my man, that's 90% of the game. That's 90% of the game, man. You know, I remember uh, uh, Donovan told me one time, Donovan Bailey, he said, he said, Akeem, man, I would go into races sometimes and I'd know I'd already won. I was like, what you mean, D? Like, the race hasn't even the start. And he was just like, because, man, most people psych themselves out when they're in the warm up and when they get to the call room you look at them face to face and they look away from you. And he was just like, I already knew I won once you break that connection. And so for me, he was just saying a lot of people sometimes, you know, you, you just got to be able to mentally wire yourself in such a way. And so I always used to wonder, I'm just like, man, like, am I the only one nervous in these rooms? Like, I don't understand. Right. So I said, you know what, let me just ask people. Right. So I would ask my teammates, you know, I would ask um, some of the Jamaicans, I asked some of the British guys, some of the, you know, people who I knew and they would say, yo, of course we're nervous. And then I realized this, man, um, <laughs> a lot of the times it's a big poker game. Mm-hmm. Whoever can put the best poker face on is usually the ones who do well, because what I realize in pressure situations, man, I get this question a lot with athletes, they get into these big stages in these big games and they think, man, I got to do something different. Absolutely. That is the worst thing that you can do because what got you there is trusting your preparation and rising to the opportunity. But usually when you get to a, those positions and you do something new, especially in track specifically, it usually doesn't go well. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the whole anxiety, I like how you said it's, it's kind of like a poker game because everybody deals with a certain amount of anxiety before a sporting event, whether they're amateur, semi-pro, professional, or of course the Olympic stage, right? And I think it, it's all about finding that balance. I, I think in anything in sports, too much of it is a good thing and too little of it, or too much of it is a bad thing, sorry, and too little of it, too little of, it is a bad thing as well. When you look at something like anxiety, I think everyone's naturally a bit anxious because they care so much. They've invested so much time into it. It's impossible to not be at least a little bit anxious or a little bit nervous. And for a lot of people, it kind of, kind of clicks in that fight or flight response, right? With a little bit of anxiety kind of heightens your awareness a little bit, kind of gives you, you're a little bit more on edge, but in a good way. Um, Mm -hmm. I see so many young athletes, they think that they have to be like, I don't want to say, I'm like, I guess, yeah, kind of like a robot where they have no anxiety, no emotions, right? They're just zeroed in, but we're all human. We all feel these emotions and it's about accepting and, and really learning from these emotions and then, then pushing them to a side and forgetting about them. Absolutely, man. Like I think nerves is a good thing because nerves means you care. Yeah. If, you, if you're in competition and you're not nervous, look, you probably, you probably don't care as much as you think you do, yeah. right? So, so for me, I think, I think it's important to know that um, emotions are a part of us and we can't often let our emotions sway us during competition. But when you are finished and you are really happy about your performance and you feel excited for it, you'll let that show. Like, don't, don't keep that in, right? Like, be you in every single aspect that you are. Like, I'm a person, I'm a calm guy, man. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm always calm, I'm collect. That's just the nature of how I am. Whether I'm in sport or I'm at the house just chilling, like, I'm just calm. So sometimes people would be like, man, Akeem, how are you so calm, man? Like, what's the secret? I'm like, man, that's just who I am. Like, I'm, I'm excited inside, but me, I'm just like, you know, I got to make sure that I'm me. And if you aren't, you, you got to understand how you operate. If you don't know how you operate, you're going to mimic everybody else, how they operate. And you're going to fall into their trap and their spell. And then when you get into the field or the track, they're going to be like, I got you right where I want you. 
Yeah. I think for a lot of people, they see somebody do something successfully and they say, that's the way it's got to be. Let me do everything that way. And even, uh, I guess, a really small example of myself, I always get razzed by my buddies because when I go to the gym, I like to listen to kind of like slow, chill music when I'm lifting or I'd be deadlifting. I don't know, three, 400 pounds and, and listening to some chill music. And they're like, man, you got to listen to ACDC or Drake or whoever it is. Right. But it's like, that's just, that's just the music that works for me. And, and probably if I listen to the music they wanted me to listen to, I wouldn't perform to the level I am. So being individualized and being authentic, I think is so important for athletes, not only to perform to your best potential, but also to be happy. Cause if you're not doing this, if you're doing this and you're not happy, then I mean, it's a cliche, but why are you doing it then? Yeah, man, you got to find the best method that works for you. Like I remember when I was in Phoenix, my coach, Stuart McMillan, who I believe is one of the greatest coaches when it comes to biomechanics, period. Um, he used to have this thing where he incorporates, if we're racing at 6 p.m. at night, you know, he has the the day kind of structured out. And there is this section that he blocks off for like naps, right? And I'm not, I'm not a nap guy. And so I'm looking at it when I first, when I first started training with him, I said, I said, coach, I'm not about to do this. Like I'm like napping is, I, I just can't nap. And he was like, well, what can you do? I was like, well, if you want me to just like rest and just maybe work on some visualization or just lay down, like I can do that, but I'm not going to fall asleep. He was like, okay, cool. So where everybody else would nap, I would fill it with something that works for me. Right. So everybody's different level is, is, is different and you got to find what works for you, because once you find what works for you, that is the formula that will lead to your own personal success. I love that a lot. Cause it sounded like you, you and your coach there, you kind of had like a dual relationship there where he's helping you be an athlete. And you're kind of helping him being a coach as well, learning, getting him to kind of learn how to individualize, individualize his programming. I see so many coaches out there and they think that their way is the only way the athletes have to follow through. And, and of course you kind of lose that individual piece to it and, and that authentic piece to it that helps, helps the athletes out. Um, I want yeah. to get your sense, get your sense of, of, of when, this whole sports psychology piece to sports really started to click in for you when you started to really think that it was 90% of the game, like you mentioned earlier, man, you know, so my, my, my way into that is kind of different than most people, man. You know, I remember I had a coach, uh, my first football coach, he said, you know, it came, you know, sports and football will teach you a lot about life. And I never really agreed with that because my life and the way how I, I grew up in the things that I had to overcome literally prepared me for the ups and down of sport. And so for me, it was a little bit different. So man, I just, I wired myself at an early age to do extra work that nobody else was willing to do. I created, I created the second person because there would be times where I would go out and I would train at nine 30, 10 o'clock at night. And I needed that extra person to fuel me so I would trade and say you know what Kim man they don't want to see you be successful man like they keep calling you slow or you know what I'm saying or 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 they say because you know you're you're this tall and, and your turnover is like this like you won't be able to run these times I was they like there was nobody there was nobody else there but I created that and so I learned early that especially in the off season, I train twice as hard, especially in the weight room and especially like on the track and dial in twice as much because I want to be able to train my mind and the capacity of my volume so that when I do get towards the season, the fact that, you know, I've trained two a days and then I got to go on the circuit for a month. It's not a big deal to me. Because I've already prepared myself in the off season, I've already prepared myself before the season even started for the rigorous training on the up and downs, right? So I always made sure that my preparation, I really dialed down in the off season to make sure that I was going to be able to, men to mentally sustain what was going to happen. Now, you don't know when you're going to have a bad race or when you're going to have a, have a good one. But always be prepared for what's to come and what may take time for it to become a result. So for me, man, I just doubled down um, when I was alone. You know, I, 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 I made sure that I was mentally locked in when I was alone in the dark. Because whatever, however it is that you prepare yourself mentally, physically in the dark, 
you are only going to be elevated in the spotlight. So I just make sure that in the dark, man, I am who I say I am. I wasn't trying to, I wasn't trying to go out there and please anybody else. I was trying to, I was trying to make sure that Akeem doubled down on what he said and made sure that I was going to do. You know, it's, 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 you always get exposed for the work you do or you don't do at some point. So you might as well do it now. I think that's such a relevant topic for something like the Olympics that it comes around for track and field at least once every four years. Of course, there's some athletes there that can do winter and, and summer, but uh, for track and field, once every four years, they, they see those 10 or 11 seconds, nine seconds, if you're Usain on, on the track. Um, and that's all that the fans see, right? They don't see the four years of preparation that went in before, before that. A lot of people, there's a, a kind of game I like to play on the podcast here towards the end is I kind of say a quote, get you to reflect on it or whatnot. And we, we spit about that. But one of the quotes I'll just say now, because it's super relevant here is from Lionel Messi. Hope everybody knows who he is. But he, <laughs> he said, people think I'm, I'm an overnight success, but it took me 17 years and 114 days. Like people, they, all they see in the soccer, they only see the 90 minutes on the pitch. In track and field, they see the nine or 10 seconds. They don't see those four, those four years that you took beforehand to get, prepare yourself to where you had to be. Yeah, man. Like there, like there are some losses that I took, man. And even though you are, you have a team around you, your team isn't taking the losses with you, right? And so, man, like there's some, like there's so many times where I would run and I wouldn't run well, and I got to take that long road back, that long pathway back to the back of the room. And as you're taking that long pathway back, there's people in the stands. There's about I don't know, maybe 10, 10, 20,000 in the stands. And then there's probably a couple million watching on TV and they all see what happened. Like they, they all saw it. Right. Can't hide. And then you, you can't hide from it. Right. It's not football. You're not wearing a mask. And so, man, it's, it's, I remember man in, in, in 2010. Right. And I tell people all the time, I said, you know, you gotta be able to fall, be focused more in the day to day as you are visioning the end result. And I remember from 20, 2010, um, I ran 673 in high school. Um, I was the number number one or number two in North America to 60 meters coming out of high school, right? I pulled my hamstring the first race outdoors. So I had this personal best of 673 indoors. I went to a junior college before I went to the University of Alabama. I did not run a personal best in 2011. I did not run a personal best in 2012. I did not run a best in, in 2013, nor 2014. And I went through the collegiate system. I ran a personal best in 2015. I ran 651, third fastest Canadian time of all time. I was number one in the world. And I finished number three in the world that year. So for five years, for five years, I did not run a personal best. I was getting destroyed to 60 meters. Oh, yeah. man, I was getting left behind, left, right, and center. But I knew that at some point, once the system makes itself fitting for me, once I can find a way to get healthy, once I can do all these different things, it takes a lot of different uh, intangible things mm -hmm. to be successful but i knew at some point i knew at some point that a breakthrough would come and so you know it it took five years and, and five years is, is, is a long yeah, time it's a, it's a, it's a long losses. time to wait <laughs> why, why do you think it, it took so long because obviously if, if you pulled your hamstring that's it's obviously not a, a five-year recovery at least i would hope not <laughs> but why do you yeah. think why do you think that for those five years you you really struggled to get back to to who you were in 2010 so I was, I was, I was having some, some, some tough indoor seasons, but I was having some pretty decent outdoor seasons. You know, I was running some personal best outdoors, uh, but in, in, in track and field, man, um, part of it too is the coach, right? The coach puts you, the coach is, it's a 50, 50 thing, right? Like, so a coach is a person that they got the plan for you, right? They got the plan, they got the blueprint and you just got to do the work to match the plan and the blueprint and you got to be able to adjust. So I just, I had some coaches that weren't right for me. Um, I had some injuries that kept happening to me, not just the hamstring, but, you know, quad injuries, hernias and stuff like that. 
And so in 2015, man, the biggest difference was I was just a lot healthier. And I knew that if I could stay healthy, I'd run well. Mm -hmm. And I had a coach, I had a coach who really um, showed me that, look, if we get you healthy, this is the workouts that we can do. And I had some workouts that really worked for me. But for the main thing, man, it was, it was just me being, being healthier um, than most seasons. I got to imagine it wasn't just physical health, but, but mental health that as an athlete, you obviously are very aware that you haven't hit your personal best in, in two, three, four years, whatever, whatever it is, what are you telling yourself day to day? Like, are you able to, to stay positively motivated during those years? Or was it something that you had to kind of look back on and then with hindsight, look at it with, with a clearer picture? You know, if I could say one thing to help any athlete, man, is you got to learn to develop short-term memory, right? And short-term memory is that thing where it doesn't mean that you don't, like, you completely forget about the loss, right, and forget what happened. But what I mean by that is you have to find a way to extract the good in what didn't go right. Because if you can find something to take from what didn't go right, you can take that, find the positive, and apply it in your training and apply it somewhere else, but you've now found a good, you've now found something that you can say, you know what, my start wasn't the greatest, but I like how I finished. Mm -hmm. That will change your perspective from a negative one to a educational self-learning one. So for me, man, that's, that's what I developed there. And I had to learn that this isn't always going to be how it's always going to be, right? I just had to make sure that I got myself. So it was a lot of self-talk every single day. It wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't once a week. It wasn't twice a week. It was literally every single day. I had to remind myself, you know, Akeem, once you get back healthy, once you get back right, like everything will go um, a little bit better. But um, mentally, man, you know, I, I, I had some good group of people in my life that, that kept reminding me, uh, that things, you know, are going to change soon and that to just continue moving with it. Um, but I definitely had to give myself, you know, speeches 24 yeah. seven to remind myself, um, that man, this isn't, it's not always going to be like this. Yeah. And a lot of the athletes that I talk to, they always talk about, um, how important that supporting cast is of friends, families, coaches, teammates, whoever it may be. Right. And, and I also think, on, on, I guess, to play devil's advocate a bit to that, I think that there, there's a certain, um, th- there's, there's a certain effect to it when the motivation comes from yourself. Of course, other people can kind of razz you up and, and they can kind of get you motivated for something. But if, if you're not feeling motivated yourself, they can only pick you up so much. So I really like how you, you kind of focused in on that of how you were doing the self-talk with yourself and you were trying to motivate yourself. You, of course other people are there contributing and, and they play such a huge factor, but I think it's, it's, there's two pieces to the equation and they both have to be there. hundred percent, you know, uh, uh, motivation comes from, comes from within, you know, I, I, I think inspiration is more helpful than motivation because motivation comes and goes, right. But when you feel inspired, that's, that's something from the soul. That's something within. That's something right? like life, lifelong. Yes. And, and, and motivation may be one week, two weeks, but inspiration will be that voice in your head that continues to say, you know what, you got a little closer today. You know, you got a little, you know, maybe if you do this differently, you'll be able to, it, it's that's, it's that intrinsic thing that says, you know what, there is something greater, something bigger here. And so, you know, I think, I think um, it really goes back down to, what do you want for you in this sport? Like, what's the real purpose behind it? Like, what is the root of why you want to be an athlete or why you want to be a business owner, whatever the thing may be, what is the main purpose of it? And I think once you find the core of what it is you're doing it, man, I think, I think inspiration can, can, can come from anywhere. I know for me, it does. I like that a lot. I, I probably challenge a lot of athletes out there. I, I'm huge on the words that you tell yourself have such a meaning. Like for example, a lot of people, they look at something that happened and they think that it, that it was a good or bad result. And then that's such a value based judgment of what happened. Mm-hmm. I always encourage people to say, I either like it or I didn't like it or I want it or I didn't want it. Try to remove some of that value from it. 
point I'm trying to make though is I think the words we tell ourselves are so important and they mean so much. So I would challenge athletes out there not to think about what motivates them, but to think about what inspires them. And I think just changing that one word can really open up your perspective um, on lifelong inspiration that can push you day in and day out rather than like you said, the motivation that, that can come and go week by week, month by month or whatever it may be. Yeah, you know, I think it's important to, you know, when it comes to, again, I'm a big self-talk guy. Self-talk has helped me so much times. And, but just because you say something doesn't mean you believe it. Right. And so what I mean by that is you got to tell yourself something enough times until you start to believe it, right? And it may, you may have to say the same thing five times a day. Do it. Do it until you believe it in your core that says, you know what, I believe that I can get there. And sometimes, man, this is, this, is, this, is, this is something that I've seen over time, right? You know, from being to two Olympic Games, um, my first Olympic Games was 2012. You know, I was 19, 20 years old. And so we always had a young team. And the guys who were on my 2012 team were pretty much the same people who were on my, my world championship teams and guys I, I competed against in college and, you know, my 2016 Olympic team. And I would see the same guys I would compete with get starstruck when they would see their opponents or when they would see guys in like the NBA and, 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 you know, all these different things. And then they would forget that they too are on that same level in that same, in that same field. And so what I would say to someone listening to this man is like any room that you find yourself in, know that you belong there. Right. Nothing wrong with saying, oh, you know, LeBron, what's going on, man? Like so-and-so, like, like as a sign of respect. But don't forget that you didn't just get there based on um, being lucky. You got there because you put in the same amount of work that they hid, just a different sport, and you put yourself there. And so when you find yourself in that room, know that you belong there and treat it with the same way how you would treat, you know, something that you work hard to do. And, you know, I think sometimes, you know, we lose focus in those moments as well too. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. And probably about two or three weeks ago, I went on one of my YouTube video binges and I was watching a lot of videos that talked about this, <laughs> about yeah. how I think people are naturally not, this is of course a generalization, but some people are just naturally, of course, I think confidence plays a role, but they, they almost feel like they're not deserving or they feel guilty about being in, in positions of success and in a room. Like, for example, um, take the 2016 Olympics, for example, and, and that Canadian team, you're there at the same room with, with Usain Bolt, who was part of the Jamaican team, of course, right? Like, I think for a lot of people, they feel like they wouldn't deserve to be there, whether it's something that happened in the past that, that's kind of altered their psyche or just from a pure sport perspective, they're just not confident in their abilities. I think it kind of plays, again, to the whole aspect of like how you mentioned you're going to win or lose the match or whatever it is before you even step out there from a mental perspective. If you don't feel like you deserve to be there, you're not going to perform to the level that you need to succeed there. Um, and I think that, again, that comes with self-talk. And, and it's also interesting too, because I think these concepts apply not only to sports, but in life in general. I think just for me, for this podcast here, kind of when I started, I started speaking to athletes, I felt like I didn't deserve to talk to them or whatever. I kind of felt weird, like almost guilty I must have come from low self-confidence or, or whatever it may be. But the more and more I've kind of delved into these topics and speak to athletes and other mental health coaches, it's so eye-opening to me how these concepts, they kind of shift between sports and personal life and they play off of each other. It's, it's super interesting. No, absolutely, man. You know, I think there's common ground in every, in every variable, right? We can all relate to mindset and mentality because it takes a certain mindset and mentality to be able to achieve anything. You know, a person, a person who wants to get bigger and get stronger, um, you know, you got to be very disciplined with your programming, your weight programming, and definitely how you eat. Right. And that takes a certain amount of discipline. Well, how do you create discipline? Right. Well, you pick one thing that you can do every single day and you do it without making excuses. That's how you create discipline. You, you, you pick one thing. And if you can do this one thing for seven days in a row, well, you could probably do it for 14. And that 14 turns into 21. And that 21 turns into a month. And that month turns into, but it's 
figuring out how to rewire our minds mm-hmm. that I really think that we can all relate to and get some, some advice and perspective on it from all walks of life. Yeah. So I think patience is such an important value to athletics and to life in general, but, but here specifically for athletics. And like you said, if you're trying to make some sort of change in your life, whether you're an athlete or not, picking one thing and doing that consistently until it becomes a routine or a habit or whatever, and then add on to that. I think so many people are impatient and they try to change a million things at once. And that's, of course, where failure starts. And then they get discouraged and you get in kind of that negative cycle there of, of never really making any progress. Man, I am by nature, I'm not a patient person, man. Like, not by no means. But I'll tell you what, if you're not a patient person, life will force you to be patient, whether you want to be or not. Mm-hmm. Right. And what's really interesting, and I think what makes the biggest impact when it comes to a person waiting for that specific breakthrough is, you know, how you wait is going to dictate what happens when you get elevated and you get to that result. Right. Because it's funny, man, like, especially with track, right? Like, I remember one year I was running 10 fours, like all year. It's like, man, what's going on here? Then I would, then that same year I ran 10 two one time and I never ran 10 four again that whole year. And then once I ran 10 one, you know, I was running consistently 10 ones. Then when I was running um, 10 O's, it was like 10 ones, 10 twos. It just didn't happen as much anymore. Right. So it's like all of this work into waiting for something to happen. And then when it happens, you go again and you reach a different level, but you still got to be patient to get to the other one. And so, you know, I think how we wait during the everyday sessions and the everyday grueling of the grindstone of life will really say a lot about who we become along the way. But, you know, either way, uh, patience is going to make itself apparent to you, even if you don't want to be patient or not, because um, results come when you patiently work for it. One thing I want to get into here is is your little um, stint there with the Tiger Cats in the CFL, um, mm-hmm. because he, he, I think that was 2018, if I remember correctly. Yeah. But mm-hmm. in, in, of course, 2016, you get, guys get the bronze medal. So you're top three in the world in four by 100 meter relay teams. And here you are going to trial for a CFL team, essentially starting at the bottom. So yeah. just walk me through kind of your, your motivation behind that. Cause I think for a lot of people, they would have struggle, they would struggle switching sports when in one sport, they're at almost at the pinnacle of it. And then they have to switch to a sport where they're basically starting from ground zero again. Yeah, man. So, you know, I, 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 my last two years of track and field, uh, 26, 2015, 2016, 2017, well, 2017 wasn't the greatest, but 2015, 2016 were some pretty good years. You know, I was starting to put some things together, um, 2016, um, a week before I ran the hundred meters I signed with, no, the day of before I, before I ran the hundred meters, I, I signed with Puma. So I had to train, you know, I had to change spikes. Um, but I also knew that, uh, I wanted to play football as well too. Um, So when I got to Hamilton, when I got to Hamilton, I had already done some training that whole off season, right. Just to get things into back into football shape. Uh, My coach at the time, my strength and conditioning coach out here was Drew Robertson, uh, the man's a machine. You know, he, I put on 12, 13 pounds. Um, You know, I, I, I usually competed about 163, 164, but I bulked up to 174, 175, but I didn't want to get too heavy because I still wanted to be able to run that four, three, four, mm-hmm. two speed. Uh, so when I got there, man, um, it wasn't, yeah, it was different. It was new, but it wasn't anything that I wasn't used to, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. I think there's certain things that, 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 uh, kind of go hand in hand like I think football and track go hand in hand when it comes to training wise to some extent um but when I got there man I just told myself you know they're going to want to know three things can this guy catch a football that's one can this guy run laterally can this guy take a hit that was all I knew that was one of the cases and so you know I I thought I had a very good camp and some of the feedback that I was getting you know Jeremiah Masuli 
um, said, you know what, you know, we found out early that, you know, that this kid can play ball, like on the news. That's, that's what he said. Mm-hmm. And coach June said some same thing. He said, you know what, he catches the ball pretty good. You know, he's, he's, he's not just another track guy. And then, so, you know, I controlled everything that I could when the opportunity presented itself. And so for me, mentally, I was already locked in, you know, physically I was already there. And, you know, for whatever reason, it just didn't happen. It just didn't play out that way. But that transition to me, you know, I just had to really mentally focusing and making sure like, okay, Akeem, right. You got to catch the ball first again, then run. You know what I'm saying? So it was just those small things that I had to, that I had to remember. Yeah, man. And and, and after it was done, how how at peace were you with the decision? Because I'm not sure if if you um, ventured into any other football opportunities later, or you just kind of had your peace with with what it was. I ask this because I think for a lot of people, a lot of athletes specifically, when something doesn't go their way, they'll get really upset, angry, discouraged, can use a million different adjectives to describe them. (laughs) But it kind of sounds like you 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 really weren't. You kind of had the mindset of you control what you can control, and, and you did it to the best of your ability, and and you did that, and and you're happy with it. Is that true, Adam? Man, you know I'm a I'm a firm believer in putting everything that you have and what you're doing, and you know I gave my all to track and field. Um, I never I wasn't one of those people who took a day off, you know, I, I honestly probably, sh- probably should have learned how to, how to take it easy sometimes in training. I probably would have helped. And so in football, I knew that I prepared the best that I could. Um, I gave my everything to it, to train, to prepare for it. Um, I had a, I had a good camp and, you know, it, it, it just wasn't meant to be, it just wasn't in the cards for me. And, and, and I was okay with that. And I was okay with that because in hindsight, I knew that I could play at that level. And I knew that, you know, maybe this was God's way of saying, you know what, Akeem, you got to save your body for something else because I have something bigger in stores for you. But I tell people all the time, if you're thinking of retiring or if you're thinking of throwing in the towel, maybe it's injuries or maybe you're just maybe a little burnt out. Look, you got to ask yourself, is this something that I'm going to be able to live with? And if the answer doesn't come right away, then you probably haven't maxed out everything that you probably could. And so um, for me, I gave my everything to the, to the sport world. And I was able to walk away from it, no regrets, no, man, I should have done this, should have done that better. No, I, 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 I did do that. <laughs> I did yeah. do that to the best of my ability that I could. And so I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. And I got to imagine the, the, the type of motivation or inspiration that was driving you also helped you kind of be at peace with with the result. Of course, the the whole the whole concept of intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. If you were in it for external reasons, rather whether it was money, fame, whatever it may be, of course you'd be upset with the result. But if you're in it for intrinsic reasons, intrinsic motivation, inspiration, like we talked about, then as long as you put in your best effort and you enjoyed yourself and, and you have no regrets that's pretty much all you can ask for. And, and when you ever, whenever you get on it, whenever you take on an extra venture. Yeah. hundred percent, man. And you know, I, I, I think everything goes back to the reason why you want to do it. Um, if, if, if you're doing it for external sources, if you're exter- if you're motivated by external factors, man, that's not going to last. Mm-hmm. Right. But there's a big shift that I think happens in a person's life when you go from shifting um, to trying to prove people wrong, to trying to prove yourself right. When you make that shift to trying to prove yourself right, man, you'll see some breakthroughs in different areas of your life that you probably wouldn't have gotten to if you didn't make that shift or it'll take a lot longer, right? Because at the end of the day, like you can't, <laughs> someone's always going to say something about you, right? You could, a person could have, you could, a quarterback could throw you the ball 15 times, and you catch it 13 times and you have like 400 yards, but the two drops that you make and you guys didn't win the game, they're going to say, you know what? We need a new receiver. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's, he's not clutch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, every day, you know, you just got to make sure that you are giving your best effort and don't worry about the rest of the stuff. It's going to play out how it's going to play out. But 
control what you can control because you can't control anybody else. <laughs> Man, you, you really can't. Even even somebody like Michael Jordan, who's the greatest of all time, and after his documentary came out, of course, everybody, most people loved it. But the Jordan haters, they they had some some ammunition there to go after him, right? And and if somebody like Michael Jordan isn't isn't immune to criticism, nobody is immune to criticism. There's always going to be naysayers. There's always going to be haters. I think I think it's just part of part of being an athlete and, and part probably part of being a person just in life. There's been people that you come across in your life as well that you don't get along with or or that gossip about you, whatever it may be. It's about controlling what you can control. You can't control what anybody else in the world says about you. All you can control is what you say about yourself. Man, you said it spot on. Like I believe that I believe that everybody everybody is a bad guy in somebody's story. Mm-hmm. Um, but you just gotta do your best to do more good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Listen, man, like I said before, I had a little game like to play here with the sports psychology quotes. Um, so I got 23 here. I'll get you to pick a number between one and 23 and then I'll read you the quote and then just, re- just reflect on it in a bit and tell me how much, what that quote means to you. All right, man, let's go with five. Five. This is uh, I feel like this one's kind of in line with what we've been talking about today is from Tom Brady. Um, he said, if you don't believe in yourself, why is anyone else going to believe in you? 100%, man. Um, you know, <laughs> you got you to gotta think of yourself higher than you ever thought that you could be. Not in an arrogant or a cocky way, but in a confident way that you mm-hmm. can aspire to get one day. There, there really is a difference between between confidence and cocky. And I think even even for me, as I reflect back on, on when I, I still play sports now, but just reflected on my whole athletic career, I think I had a tough time distinguishing between confidence and cocky. I, I thought that everything that came up that could potentially, I would think is confidence may actually be cockiness. So I really was reserved in that regards. Right. But I think, I think it's just part of being an athlete. I think athletes to a certain degree have to be a bit selfish like that, right? And kind of show that confidence and, and, and not only for yourself, but for other people as well to inspire others and to be that leader, especially in a team environment. Man, I, the person who can control their ego the best is usually the ones that has the most success because we all have an ego. Anybody who says different, you're a liar. Like we all have an ego. But can you control your ego? Knowing when to speak, knowing when to be quiet, knowing when to work a little harder and knowing when to rest. But they all go hand in hand, right? And so, you know, the, the, the person who can control their ego, man, that's a, that's, a, that's a dangerous individual. Yeah. You have another number between one and 23. We'll, we'll do one more quote here before we wrap up. Uh, let's, do, let's do 17. 17. This is uh, from Serena Williams. Of course, everybody should know legendary tennis American <laughs> player. She said, I, can't, I decided I can't pay a person to rewind time, so I may as well get over it. Oh, man, that goes back to what I was saying, man. Short-term memory, man. Yeah. It's, 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 it's so true. It's such a great quote because you know what? You are, as people, we evolve every, every day, every week, every month, every year. And as we evolve, we get, to, we get to choose the direction of how and where we want to evolve and end up. And every day, we got to make a certain series of decisions. And every decision, every small decision makes a big decision at the end of the week. Mm-hmm. And so every week, you got to genuinely say to yourself, did I make enough small decisions that I can say that I made the most of my days and my week? Success is a bunch of small decisions stacked up on top of each other over time. And so it is in those everyday tasks that we say, you know what, I can live with this. I can't live with that. I'm going to change that. I'm going to work on that. And so, man, we got to be able to pick and choose, um, but also know that we can't dwell on certain things too long. Otherwise, that holds us from accepting something new into our lives. Exactly. And just like the quote says, you, you can't change what's happened in the past. You can use it as a learn opportunity. You Absolutely. can think about it. You can, you can talk about it, whatever, but you can't go back and change what happened. So you might as well get over it, right? You might as well <laughs> look ahead and, 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 and see what you can do to ensure that doesn't happen again. And I think another important topic or point 
around that. We might have discussed it a bit already today, but it is the idea of perfection. And I think people would kind of get it caught up that every single small decision they make has to be 100% perfect. And as soon as they make that one mistake, that's when they really start to get down on themselves, right? And I think as humans, everyone's human, of course, nobody's, nobody's perfect. We have to recognize that we'll make good decisions and bad decisions. It's just part of being life. As an athlete, I'm sure you've made decisions that were helpful to your development and, and other de- uh, decisions that were uh, detrimental to your development, right? But it's just yeah. all about being human. It's all about just accepting that it's a process and there's ups and downs. Um, but as long as you're trending upwards over time, you're, you'll generally get to, to where you are to be happy. Yeah, man. Uh, I, I think you hit it spot on. You know, we, we, we have to know that I think perfection is something that we aspire to be. And I think we should have something to aspire to. But understand that perfection isn't attainable. You don't know everything. You won't know everything. And you shouldn't want to know everything. Mm-hmm. You should want to improve on something every single day. Um, and, and I think if a person is already perfect, <laughs> you have nothing to work on. And when yeah. you have nothing to work on, it's like, what do you do? Yeah, <laughs> what yeah. do you, what do you do? You know? So perfection, man, while it is a great aspiration and we should aim to be perfect. Cause I think it gives us something to improve and to, and to get better on each day. Don't expect perfection. Start with where you are, start with what you have and cultivate that. It's it's like it, it reminds me of video games where you, you're leveling up or whatever. I play a lot of a lot of FIFA, so an ultimate team, you're collecting players and whatnot, right? And leveling up your team and everything. And it's the process of getting to the peak is what's fun. And once once I get to the end result, it's like, what do I do now? Like, there's there's nowhere else to improve. I kind of get bored of it, right? So I always challenge people to always look at ways to improve. Always set goals for yourself to attain. Um, because that's, that's, I think where, where the best source of motivation or inspiration could come from. Man, it reminds me of, of, uh, of, uh, of NBA, you know, 2k as well too, when you create your player, right. And you put all the stats to like 99, right. Yeah. Isn't it crazy how you put all your stats to 99 and you shoot a jump shot and you still miss? (laughs) <laughs> what does that say you know yeah. it's, it's, you should never miss right. uh, but you, you know but you do you know and and you know so it it happens right exactly. but you got to continue you got to continue shooting <laughs> exactly man listen to key man I, I i appreciate you coming on man share everybody your insight on, on the the side of sports psychology from a track and field football and, and just an overall life perspective. Super appreciative of it. And, um, and again, this was a huge blast to, to, to have you on. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate what you're doing and, and the way how you're attacking, man, because, you know, the mentality of a person, you know, we all need some type of perspective on it because somebody's perspective can help another. Right. And, and again, I appreciate that, man. And if anybody wants to uh, to get in contact with you, social media or email, whatever it is, I know you're kind of doing some, you're still doing some public speaking stuff. Yeah, man. So I guess, uh, so I guess with COVID, it's kind of it's kind of kind of weird, but <laughs> yeah. So uh, um, I'm I'm full time speaking. Um, I've been doing some a lot of virtual engagements, which is definitely different. It's definitely a little yeah. bit more weird because it's not in person, but you know, it it, it still gets the job done. So um, all social media underdog at underdog akh um and everything else just triple w at akeeminspires.com awesome man again appreciate your time dude and um and this was a huge blast thanks again thanks again man have a good rest of your day